live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. A tropical storm barrel unleashing flooding and heavy winds along the Texas coast all morning. The storm made landfall around 4 a.m. as a Category 1 hurricane. It has since weakened back into a tropical storm as it continues drifting north. Intense video that we're seeing and ABC News reports two people have died in the wake of barrel so far and at least two million Texans have lost power. Populated places like Houston have seen their fair share of flash flooding and of course high water rescues. Now that the storm is close to passing through Texas, though, help is on the way for people who need it. The San Antonio Salvation Army sending five volunteers and two big trucks worth of aid to Wharton, Texas, which is about an hour from the Gulf Coast and an hour from Houston. They're taking two vehicles with them, the Disaster Canteen, which is a commercial kitchen on wheels, and their Rapid Response Unit, which can get to people who are trapped by fallen trees and power lines, both designed to get into disaster-stricken areas quickly. Very important that we can get into the impacted areas and get to those uh, families and first responders uh, that need us. Area Commander Joshua Robinette says this crew will spend the next two weeks helping people recover. Wharton will act as a central home base for that unit, allowing them to get into other nearby affected areas to help as they're needed. And we've seen it time and time again. Of course, San Antonians are on their way to help. Our KSAT Weather Authority has followed Barrel since day one. That includes live coverage from the coast as it made landfall in Texas. Our team has done such a great job. Mia Montgomery standing by with an updated forecast and Mia Generally speaking, is Texas out of the woods yet? Well, it's definitely getting better. And in fact, for places like Houston, Galveston, as well as College Station that saw some of the stronger impacts throughout the day, their conditions are improving at a very significant pace. But you can see what is left of barrel, still a tropical storm as of the 4 p.m. update from the National Hurricane Center. It's still moving across far northeastern Texas, northwestern Louisiana, and stretching up into parts of Arkansas, where a few tornado warnings have been issued here and there for a quick spin up. Still some heavy rain as well as some gusty winds. Speaking of heavy rain, take a look at some of the estimates here near the Houston area, even up to the woodlands and down towards Galveston. Pockets of six to even 10 inches fell as barrel started working its way inland earlier this morning, which contributed to some of those flooding issues. Unfortunately, not a lot to show from barrel here in San Antonio and even across our far eastern counties. We never like to see the flooding rain, but wish we we could have gotten at least a little bit more just a trace across our far eastern counties for the most part. We're not finished with the rain chances, though. A spotty hit or miss potential in the forecast tomorrow afternoon. We're going to get you those details coming up in just a bit. All that rain not that far away. Thank you, Mia. Well, crews in Matagorda County working to restore power and cell service. That's where Barrel made landfall this morning. Our Daniela Ibarra has been there all day checking with neighbors who prepared for this destruction. People who have property here along the bay have spent the morning cleaning up. We've seen things like torn up garages, ripped off siding, and even debris in their driveways. We spoke with a homeowner who says the damage he saw was actually not that bad. Mark Morrell and his wife have been working on building this beachside home for months. They live about an hour away and braced for barrel. I heard it was just really just this roar, but just steady roar for hours. So. Not, not fun. They drove into Matagorda this morning to check on it. He expected things like this boat port to be destroyed. So when you walked out here and saw this, yeah, what went I was like, oh Lord, I, not, not a good feeling. Not a good feeling. Instead, he says the surge just washed up debris. What damage are you seeing here? Just really, uh, we saw some roof damage. Uh, there's some uh, shingles that have popped off, and there's some kind of fixture up there that actually broke loose. Mark says his family expects to be able to enjoy this property once it's finished later this year. So far, so good. These properties are along a road that leads to the coast and earlier today it was shut down for an hour while crews cleaned up all the debris scattered along the road and people were actually stuck on the other side, but DPS says it's back open. In Matagorda County, Daniele Ibarra, KSAC 12 News. And coming up at 630, our tropical storm barrel coverage will continue on tonight's KSAT Q&A. Dr. Daniel Martinez from the American Red Cross is joining us right here in the studio at 630 to talk about what our local Red Cross volunteers are doing on the coast right now as we speak. So make sure you stick around for that. And barrel may have made landfall today, but our coverage won't stop anytime soon. You can follow along on air and online to stay in the loop on all things storm related to scan this QR code right now 
on your screen. So who will be San Antonio's next mayor? With 10 months until the city election, there are already three declared candidates in the race. And tonight, we're going to hear from the first one to throw his hat in the ring all the way back in January. John Courage, in his fourth and final term as the District 9 Councilman, he talked to City Hall reporter Garrett Berger about why he wants to take the top spot. Fond of saying there's not a conservative or liberal way to fill a pothole, Northside Councilman John Courage says a big part of his success has been from listening. You really need to reach out as a listener too though because you hear a lot of voices. Many times they represent certain interests but they may not represent everybody. With Mayor Ron Nuremberg stepping down because of term limits, Courage and the other candidates won't have to fight an incumbent or their record. I want to continue building on what we've started to make sure they work, to make sure they're successful. That includes job training, public health spending, adding more police officers, and affordable housing, which Courage believes is the city's biggest issue. He also points to his practice as a councilman of letting constituents vote on what projects to fund raising money for the city's first gun buyback and encouraging the use of special baby surrender boxes. Leadership isn't always creating something that you think. It's really being able to identify things that are around this nation and around this state and that are around this city that can be put to good use. Uh, and that's just that's just common sense leadership. He also drew flack from pro-Palestine protesters for not taking up a ceasefire resolution for the war in Gaza. How many more kids, John? You have a right to be here. But while Courage doesn't think it's the city's role to weigh in on international conflicts, the former teacher does want to promote education. In particular, getting more volunteer tutors involved in schools. He even suggested expanding a property tax break program for seniors by giving them credit for volunteering as tutors. We can actually give them a deduction on their property taxes. For more on Courage's ideas and why he thinks he should be the next mayor, check out our full interview on KSAT.com. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, new on the news at 6, the San Antonio Police Department are searching for these two suspects on your screen that they say shot and killed a Sonic employee last night. Police say the 33-year-old victim was arguing with a woman outside of the Sonic on Babcock Road near Eckerd. That argument eventually turned violent. Shots were fired and the suspects drove off. People that are regulars at that Sonic are shocked to hear that this happened. Just makes me sad for all the employees as well as the person that decided to do such a horrible thing. People have left candles outside the doors of that Sonic in memory of the manager. Police still investigating whether the two knew each other, the suspect and the victim. If you know anything about this shooting, call SAPD at the number posted on your screen. That's 210-207-4804. And for many years, a nonstop flight to Ronald Reagan International Airport in the heart of Washington, D.C. has been a dream for San Antonians. That dream, one step closer to being a reality. There's a plan that works right now within the U.S. Department of Transportation to green light that nonstop flight. Even American Airlines stepping up, up to bat for San Antonio. American is one of the biggest and busiest airlines in the entire world, and they say they know firsthand how important San Antonio is to our nation's capital, and that's why we need a direct flight. And while the flight isn't official yet, city leaders came together today to express their gratitude for all parties involved and to mark a significant milestone in the process to securing that flight. Earlier today, American Airlines submitted an application to Secretary Buttigieg and the Department of Transportation for a round-trip flight between SAT and DCA. The next phase is equally important. The city needs positive public comment to move forward with the deal. Everyone invited to submit a comment between now and next Wednesday. It only takes a few minutes to do it on the Department of Transportation website. And they expect a decision from D.C. very soon on whether or not San Antonio will get one of those flights. Well, San Antonio, a uh, San Antonio man finds sexually explicit texts on his wife's phone sent between her and a San Antonio police officer. Arturo Cisneros was arrested by SAPD at his home for domestic violence after trying to report the affair between his wife and Officer Mark Castillo. I was in shock. Cisneros says he locked himself in a bedroom to read all of the messages while his wife pounded on the door, demanding her phone back. According to SAPD records, Cisneros later called 911 and said his wife hit herself before taking off. The report states the wife returned and asked police to look at her face, which had a large bruised knot on the right side of her forehead. 
She attributed the injury to Cisneros punching her in the eye and forehead. Reached for comment, the woman told KSAT she had not asked police to look at her face and that the report was, quote, wrong and inaccurate. Cisneros told KSAT he did not hit his wife. There was no physical altercation. Still, officers believe they had enough to arrest Cisneros for misdemeanor family violence. The incident report, it's worth noting, makes no mention of Castillo, even though that was Cisneros' sole reason for calling police in the first place. The report itself, it lacks so many details, so many details. Cisneros' sister-in-law took pictures of his wife's messages with Castillo and told KSAT she later provided them and the phone itself to SAPD Internal Affairs. It's all about protect, serve, you know, do the job that you're assigned to do, nothing else. A review of the messages by KSAT shows many of them were sent during Castillo's assigned work hours, Monday through Thursday, between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m., and while the officer was in close proximity to McManus. Castillo, writing to Cisneros' wife at one point, expletive, wanted to touch her legs. After she replied, you still can, I'm headed over there now, Castillo responded, I'm still with Chief, but he might be done soon. Or this exchange, in which Castillo described a sex act with her, told her to make sure she erased the messages, and then revealed that McManus was about to walk out. SAPD officials refused to make Chief McManus available for an interview for this story, stating the complaint against Castillo is being investigated and that the department cannot comment on media inquiries that have not resulted in discipline. And that's just part of the story. Tomorrow on the night beat, KSAT investigates how Cisneros is called a 911 could have serious legal consequences for him and how Castillo is not the first member of the chief security detail to be accused of inappropriate sexual behavior while in uniform. Check out Trans Guide right now, and let's go to I-10 at the Y. I don't think that's the Y. That's not what it usually looks like. Uh, but you can see traffic moving along very smoothly. The Y is usually around the, the silver, the fine silver fine building. Silver. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be mislabeled. But again, this is I-10, and you can see traffic moving very smoothly in both directions. No problems there. All right, several sentences scheduled to be handed down in the courthouse this week. The cases we're keeping an eye on in the coming days, that's next on the News at 6. The city is looking to the community for direction on how it should continue its cool pavement pilot program. Coming up tonight on the night beat, a discussion in District 3 and how you can make your voice heard. Let's make a deal. No big trials expected this week, but several high profile cases showing up at the docket as well as some of those cases ending in plea deals. Right. Erica Hernandez is keeping an eye on what we can expect at the Justice Center this week. A man accused of playing a role in the starvation and abuse of his four year old son has a hearing Tuesday. Brendan Savetta is out on bond. In April, the boy's stepmother, Miranda Casades, was sentenced to 25 years in prison for her part in the case. Savetta's trial date could be scheduled during Tuesday's hearing. Also making a court appearance on Wednesday, Jesse Garcia. If the name sounds familiar, he's accused of shooting three San Antonio police officers last summer. Garcia faces numerous charges, including aggravated assault of a public servant. The case is in its early stages and evidence is still being handed over to the defense. After several delays, this man, Juan Santos Huerta, is scheduled to be sentenced Wednesday. He's accused of severely neglecting his 74-year-old mother and cashing more than $69,000 from her health care provider checks. Huerta took a plea deal last month on charges of injury to the elderly and Medicaid fraud. Specifics of that deal have not been revealed, but he has applied for probation. And on Friday, Giovanni Pashal will have to decide between a plea deal or heading to trial. Pashal is accused of shooting and killing a woman outside a Valero gas station last summer. According to an arrest affidavit, the entire incident was caught on surveillance video. Now, if Pashal doesn't take a plea deal, he is facing up to life in prison. For an update on this case and all other court cases, just head to the court page on KSAT.com. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's take a live look outside with live cam. Beautiful blue skies. I know we didn't get a lot of that 
uh, rain or any at all, Mia, right. from Barrel. But uh, we did get a little bit of wind. Nothing in comparison, though, to exactly. what they saw. Exactly. It was a little breezy at times today, especially earlier this morning and into the early afternoon. We had some gusts generally upwards of about 25 miles per hour here in San Antonio. But yes, as Courtney just mentioned, nothing in comparison to what our friends saw closer to the coast and across southeast Texas this morning as Barrel made landfall and started moving inland. Freeport, 97 miles per hour. That was the peak wind gust over there near Matagorda Bay, 91 near downtown Houston, 89 Port Arthur and near Beaumont, a 61 mile per hour wind gust was the peak since midnight, 59 in College Station and 47 in Victoria. Here's the latest on barrel winds now sustained at about 45 miles per hour as it works its way through northeast Texas, closing in near western Louisiana, southwestern Arkansas, moving to the north northeast at about 16 miles per hour. It is expected to continue on this general track as it scoots across Arkansas through the overnight hours, weakening as it does so into a tropical depression by about 1 a.m. and then a remnant low by tomorrow afternoon. In terms of rain, it is still expected to bring parts of northeast Texas near Texarkana an additional two to even five inches by the time all is said and done. That is why a flood watch has been issued near Tyler up to Texarkana and even to Little Rock that runs through the overnight and into early Tuesday morning as well. If you were curious, this as well as areas in southeast Texas that got flooding rain from barrel, actually not even in drought. Who is in drought? Us here in San Antonio and even more so the farther west that you go west of I-35 near the Rio Grande. A few pockets of extreme drought still in place. I wish that we were able to find at least a little bit of rain from barrel, but unfortunately with the center of that system passing well east of the Alamo City, it just wasn't in the cards for us here locally. What could be in the cards though for us tomorrow, specifically after 2 p.m., a few hit or miss spotty showers and storms. I want to go ahead and talk about that setup. There's barrel again working through northeastern Texas. A disturbance on the far western edge of that system was enough to spark up a few isolated showers across our southwestern counties again near Crystal City and Carrizo Springs. A lot of that starting to come to an end. Just a 10% chance remains throughout the remainder of the evening. Looking ahead to your Tuesday, partly cloudy throughout the first half of the day, pretty quiet, but you can see here on your future cast by about 2 to 3 p.m. West of the I-35 corridor, portions of the hill country near the southern Edwards Plateau. That's when we could start to find a few downpour isolated thunderstorms. It's not going to be for everybody, but if you do cash in to a quick downpour, it could potentially make for a few soggy spots out there on area roadways during the evening commute, and then that will continue to work its way farther off to the south, weakening as it does so into Tuesday evening. Other than that, 75 at 7 a.m., 90 degrees around noon for any lunchtime plans, high temperature near 96. Isolated daily chances continue through Saturday, most of us missing out on Unfortunately, each day other than that, just hot with highs in the mid 90s. By the way, we'll have some KSAT Connect photos from the Houston area to show coming up at 645. Yeah, some of those images have been really intense. All right, thank you so much, Mia. All right, a big decision made by a local wide receiver and maybe surprising some people, Mary. Yes, it's always nice when we have the time to kind of dive into some of these local decisions because they're happening all the time. Steals wide out. Jalen Cooper shares the reason behind his decision to commit to MS SMU. Excuse me. Plus, after Tiger Woods passed, Keegan Bradley is announced as the U.S. Ryder Cup team captain for 2025. Stay with us. Antonio Spurs have finalized the Harrison Barnes deal from Sacramento in a three team trade that also involves the Bulls. The Spurs also receiving the right to swap first round picks with the Kings in 2031, as well as sending Raekwon Gray to Chicago. In a necessary step after acquiring Barnes and Chris Paul, San Antonio is waiving former St. Anthony Yellow Jacket Charles Bassey. It's being reported the Spurs are interested in investigating a way to bring the center back if the 23 year old clears waivers. Bassey is coming off of an ACL tear he sustained in December. 
Six-time PGA Tour winner Keegan Bradley will captain the United States Ryder Cup team in 2025. The news revealed after 15-time major champion Tiger Woods passed on the opportunity. The 38-year-old will be the youngest Ryder Cup captain since Arnold Palmer in 1963. Bradley was infamously snubbed from the 2023 Ryder Cup squad by the previous U.S. captain Zach Johnson. Certainly a full circle moment for Bradley. Great job by the team. Um, oh, it's been a while. I know we won St. Pete, but this is this is a proper win. We we earned this one this weekend. That's San Antonio's Pato Award, who earned his second win of the season yesterday in Lexington during the Indy 200 at Mid-Ohio. Award took the lead with 24 laps remaining and hung on to win. This is his first victory on track this season and first win since almost taking the Indy 500 in May. Well, as we get closer to the start of the high school football season, more and more student athletes in the area are announcing their college commitments. For Steel High School wide receiver Jalen Cooper, he announced that he's committing to Southern Methodist University. Our Nick Mantis spent time with Cooper today to learn the reason behind his decision. When you have too many highlights to choose from and offers from schools all over the country like Texas A&M and Baylor, we had to know what made Jalen Cooper decide to take his talents to SMU. Whenever I went to the visit, you know, Coach Reck, Coach Jenkins, Coach uh, Likens, they all pulled me in office and they watched my film, you know, which was pretty cool. I never seen this film that they had about me and just seeing it, you know, it was like, dang, they really, you know, look, in, look deep into what, what I got to show. Most schools during recruitment want to make somebody like Jalen feel as comfortable and at home as possible. But when it comes to Jalen's decision, it was not just about the team he's going to be playing for, but also the level of competition he's going to be going up against. And now that SMU is part of the Atlantic Coast Conference, that played a huge role in Jalen's decision. I looked at SMU's schedule this year and they're playing, you know, Miami, Florida State, Duke, Cal, you know, those are all good teams, you know, so, you know, SEC is all great and everything, but ACC is just as good and I feel like if I want to, you know, be out there, it's a perfect place to be. The coaching staff's going to be there for a while. I feel they can, you know, develop me to the best I can, to the best ability I can, and I feel like I have the best shot of going to the NFL there. Nick Mantis, KSAT 12 Sports. And SMU landing a lot of top recruits. That's awesome. Yeah, congratulations to Jalen. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Mary. All right, we'll be talking to the local executive director of the Red Cross right after this. Welcome back. Our coverage is continuing with Hurricane Barrel, now Tropical Storm Barrel, but we have been talking a lot for the last couple days about the Red Cross response. Locally, we have a lot going on, so we want to welcome back. You were here yesterday, yes. Dr. Yeah. Daniel Martinez, with the, uh, the executive director of our local Red Cross, Central and South Texas. Thank you so much for what you've been doing. We had you here yesterday in the evening, you came in on a Sunday, just to make sure that we had this information about the preparation. Now that preparation happened, tell us what's going on right now with recovery. Yes, yeah, so basically it was a lot of hurry up and wait, right, as we uh, look to see exactly where Barrow would make landfall. So now the 320 volunteers who have come to San Antonio from all over the country are now being mobilized to the Houston Galveston area primarily, uh, but as well as all the surrounding areas. So the 30 emergency response vehicles, the uh, volunteers, everything is now being mobilized out in that direction. So for the safety of our volunteers and shelter workers, we wait until uh, any danger has passed. And now everybody's getting sent to that area to open the shelters and to begin uh, supporting the needs of that area. And I know just, you know, what, 10 minutes ago, you were on the latest update from people who are on the ground in some of these areas affected by barrel. What are they seeing? Correct. So right now, uh, the, the 
biggest concern uh, that is being conveyed to Red Cross, of course, is flooding, which is yielding the loss of power and other issues. Unfortunately, we were discussing the loss of life that's already occurred yeah. and the other uh, major devastation. And so now it's our job as humanitarians to go in and provide as many resources as we can and to provide not only uh, shelters and those types of resources, but we also provide mental health resources, spiritual care, those types of things. So the devastation isn't um, maybe as great, uh, great as some of the previous hurricanes, but it's yeah. still devastating. Yeah, and it spans, we've been talking a lot, of course, about Matagorda because that's where it hit and made landfall, but the entire coast, I mean, we've been talking about Houston a lot, and eventually you will be deployed there? Correct. Okay. So uh, not only myself, but others from the San Antonio region and our team are all going to be deployed to that region to help provide relief services to that local chapter as well as everyone in need within the surrounding areas. You know, I said when we saw the video of the Red Cross trucks leaving, San Antonio. I said, I'm not surprised. San Antonians love to help. What is the biggest need right now? I mean, it, it, we have a couple numbers that you can call. You see one right there, 1-800-RED-CROSS. The biggest needs for you right now? Absolutely. Very simply, it's, there's two needs that we constantly have. Number one, volunteers. 90% of our workforce are volunteers, and the 320 individuals that are heading to the Houston Galveston area are all volunteers from around the country. So volunteers are always needed. We cannot deliver mission without them. The second thing is financial support. So just Red Cross response alone, we anticipate this to be about $1.5 to $2 million response effort. And that is done entirely through the efforts of the generosity of our donors. So whether it's volunteerism or financial support or donations, anyone can go onto our website, redcross.org, or call 1-800-RED-CROSS and get more information uh, to see how they can provide those resources. And I'm guessing, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but any amount helps. Every amount helps. So whether it's one dollar or a million dollars, everything is far reaching because it all gets to applied directly towards the humanitarian aid that we're providing. And you talked about volunteers. We've done multiple stories here at KSAT looking at those trainings. A lot of people out there might think, oh, this is too much for me to handle or I won't be able to help. Anyone can help volunteer. There are lots of jobs for people. It's not just deployment. Correct. Anything. So today, for example, we had individuals who are volunteering at the local office just helping with cleaning, helping provide snacks, helping to load trailers. So if it's just, hey, you know, I get a really stressful job and I want to go just provide some mindless work to help, great. If you have a specialty and a certification, as I mentioned, uh, licensed professional counselors can come and help to provide mental health services. So if uh, you want just to provide your, yourself and say, hey, I'm here, what can I do? That's great. If you have a specialty, special training, and want to lend those services as well, we gladly accept those two. You know, you said flooding is what you're hearing. Yes. Is that the biggest damage that's being done so far and where your volunteers are? This is not a one day thing for you, though. I mean, you're going to be there for weeks. What kind of damage, what kind of effects do you expect in the days and weeks to come? Right. So a lot of what we're going to be doing, especially as we look at how we open our shelters, there are different types of shelters that we open. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but because the flooding has caused so much power outage, a lot of what we're going to provide are resources for charging your cell phones, communicating with loved ones. Um, and then we provide comfort kits, which include uh, cleaning supplies so that if your home did yeah. experience any kind of flooding or damage, you can utilize the kits from the Red Cross to get those um, to get yourself started with the process of recovery. Um, and it could be any number of resources, depending on what the family or individual needs. Uh, we can help provide either direct services or through our partner agencies referrals to get the support specifically uh, that each individual would need. And I'm guessing if, you, if you've been through this, you have a lot of questions, like just where do you start? Who do I call? I'm guessing the Red Cross would also be a good resource for that. Correct. It, it's an overwhelming experience. Um, you know, not everybody who lives on the coast has actually gone through a hurricane yet. Right. Some people are moving there, right? There's a lot of people moving to Texas, which is a great thing. And it's overwhelming if you don't know. So one of the things that is so great about the Red Cross is we always find a way to yes. So that means usually we're going to provide the service or the resource. But if we can't, we're going to be the partner agency that helps each individual find the resources and uh, agencies that they need to begin that process of recovering and really healing and moving forward from this event. And quickly, something you mentioned yesterday, super helpful because we are still in the immediate aftermath. Tell us about the app. It works when you don't have service. Hopefully people yeah. have downloaded it already, but it is available. Absolutely. So the Red Cross app is truly amazing because it's easy to download. You can use it without internet service. It's constantly being updated, but it has resources where current um, 
shelters are open, current resources for individuals impacted, how you can get involved if you want to volunteer, how you can donate. And I you mentioned yesterday, even things like pet CPR and those types of things, right? Things we don't think about necessarily while we're dealing with this. It's all available on the app. All right. So great to know. Thank you yes. so much. Thank yeah. you. Texans helping Texans. 1-800-RED-CROSS, yes. redcross.org. Mm -hmm. Dr. Daniel Martinez, appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate you. And yeah. we'll keep in contact with them, especially as you deploy. Thank Thanks you. so much. Yeah, we're going to give you a key card because you come to ASAP <laughs> so often. Come every day. I love, yeah. hey, I love being we'll here. We'll see if we, we can work that out. You. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> Daily updates. We'll All be right. right back. President Joe Biden in defense mode today, working to calm concerns over his ability to run and win against former President Donald Trump. Today, Biden releasing a letter to congressional Democrats, calling into MSNBC and meeting with donors on the phone. ABC's Perry Russell breaks down what he had to say. A defensive President Biden pushing back on the growing calls for him to drop out. Today, in a letter to congressional Democrats, Biden writes, I'm firmly committed to staying in this race, to running this race to the end and to beating Donald Trump. Biden doubling down on MSNBC minutes later, blaming the elites for trying to push him out. I'm getting so frustrated by, by the elites. Now, I'm not talking about you guys, but about the elites in the party who they know so much more. But if any of these guys yeah. don't think I should let them run against me, go ahead, announce the announce president. Challenge me at the convention. The First Lady Jill Biden on the campaign trail today in North Carolina. Joe has made it clear that he's all in. It comes as White House visitor logs show an expert in Parkinson's disease visited the White House eight times in eight months from last summer through this spring. Has the president been treated for Parkinson's? No. Is he being treated for Parkinson's? No, he's not. Is he taking medication for Parkinson's? No. So those are the things that I can give you full blown answers on, but I'm not going to do. I'm not going to confirm a specialist, a, any specialist that comes to come to comes to the White House out of privacy. The Republican led House Oversight Committee is requesting an interview with Biden's personal doctor. The American people deserve to know whether or not the president of the United States is fully capable of performing his duties. According to notices obtained by ABC News, House Democrats are meeting tomorrow morning to talk about the path of the party going forward. We're being told cell phones are being taken at the door to prevent any leaks. Perry Russell, ABC News, Washington. In order to avoid Department of Justice prosecution, Boeing will be paying a fine and pleading guilty to conspiracy to defraud the U.S. That charge stems from two deadly crashes involving Boeing jetliners, one in 2018, another in 2019, where 346 people died. That fine could be north of $485 million, just a fraction of what the $25 billion that families are asking Boeing to pay. In New Mexico, actor Alec Baldwin will be inside a Santa Fe courtroom tomorrow when jury selection begins in his manslaughter trial. Baldwin facing charges in the shooting death of a cinematographer on the set of the movie Rust back in 2021. This comes a week after a judge denied a pair of motions from Baldwin's attorneys claiming prosecutors mishandled evidence. Look outside with live cam. Mia, you were talking about the KSAT Connect pictures. Yes. Obviously a very different view from what we're looking at here at home. Very, very different. Yes, a lot quieter here in San Antonio and surrounding communities today. We know that has not been the case across deep southeast Texas and near the Texas Gulf Coastline. We've got a lot of KSAT Connect photos to show you sent into our sister station, so we'll get you those. Plus, the setup in our atmosphere with a few isolated chances for rain still in the forecast here locally after the break. All right, I have to admit, for a large part of today, I looked to the east, I saw all those clouds, and I said, I bet they're getting good rain over right. there. Right. Which, when you think, I mean, it's really less than two hours away, right. they got significant rain, Mia. It is so interesting when you see these tropical systems, just how sharp the gradient is in rain. I mean, just a matter of miles. And that was something that we were stressing so much over the weekend was these tropical systems can wobble a little bit to the east or the west. And depending on how much they do wobble or they don't, that really determines our rain chances and rain totals here in San Antonio and South Central Texas. Unfortunately, we were just on the wrong side 
of this storm to get some beneficial rain. Sometimes, though, rain can be too much of a good thing. And take a look at this. We have some photos sent in to KSAT Connect, really our sister station over in Houston. This is in Houston. You can see the floodwaters there just over the street. Of course, that and the gusty high winds causing a lot of trees to fall down on power lines. I believe earlier this afternoon, over 2 million people were without power in that area. Of course, crews getting out there the best that they can to try and turn the power back on as quickly as they can. But this was a very common theme. Now over to the Sugarland area, a lot of fallen trees just bent over thanks to those gusty winds. And yes, some of the high waters, you can see some of them even uprooted a bit. So we have a lot of those on KSAT.com slash connect. If you zoom out the map and head over to the Houston area, you can check out more of those for yourself and we'll bring more of them to you later on tonight on the night beats. All right, here is the latest on barrel. Again, we just got the new update in from the National Hurricane Center. Winds now down to 35 miles per hour. So this system is weakening and that is the good news. It will continue to do so as it works its way farther up to the northeast by 10 30 p.m. tonight. Still Texarkana dealing with some moderate to heavy rain. A lot of that shifting at that point into the Arkansas area near Little Rock and that's just going to continue to work its way up near Jonesboro and even St. Louis as we head into the overnight hours. For us here in San Antonio, pretty quiet throughout the remainder of the day and even into the first half of our Tuesday as well. But after 2 p.m., a little disturbance moving around the western edge of what is left of barrel could be enough to spark up a few hit or miss showers and storms. Other than that, though, temperatures are going to continue to be pretty hot. Mid 90s each and every afternoon throughout the remainder of the week. Rain chances just isolated after tomorrow, about a 20 to 30% potential Wednesday and all the way into the start of next weekend. We were monitoring a few isolated showers across our southwestern counties near Carrizo Springs. Those pretty much fizzled out just to the north of you. Again, very dry out there throughout the remainder of this Monday and even into the first half of our Tuesday. But notice on your future cast into the early afternoon by about 2 to 2. 30 eyes will shift off to the west near the southern Edwards Plateau, Rock Springs, Lakey, Concan, potentially a few showers, a couple of downpours and maybe a few lightning strikes possible with this activity as well. Again, it's not going to be for everybody hit or miss in nature, but if you do find a downpour, it could lower visibility for the evening commute depending on where they are placed and maybe have a little bit of a sogginess on some of those area roadways as they start to work farther off to the south into Tuesday evening and Tuesday night and just isolated after that from Wednesday onward as barrel works its way up to the northeast. Another disturbance moving into the southwestern Gulf not expected to develop into anything tropical, but it could fling just enough tropical moisture into our area to keep those isolated chances going, especially across our far southern counties. Until then, we're in the mid to upper 90s right now. You can see that trend is not going anywhere throughout the rest of this week and even into the weekend. You know, even though we had this big miss silver lining, there's a, those are a lot of rain chances that we see yeah. there. Yeah, so we cash in. Exactly. All right, we've got an escargot go race when we come back. All right, Steve, we're going to start the buzz off slow today. The World Snail Racing Championship <laughs> was hosted in the UK over the weekend. More than 150 of the world's greatest gastropods made their way to England for the special event. Does it look does it look like it's a world of look at there's like 10 people there. I can't with this. There's 10 people. Yeah, okay. Maybe the crowd Jeff the Snail back. crowned the fastest of the bunch finishing the 33 centimeter race in 44 minutes and 3 seconds. <laughs> 4 minutes oh, and 3 producer. seconds. Sorry, wow. Steve Get it Four right. minutes. Sorry, I thought it was slow. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jeff didn't come even close to breaking the world record set by a snail named Archie back in the 90s. He completed this course, and look, it's not much of a course. He completed it in two minutes <gasps> and 30 seconds. Wow. Yeah. Just he, incredible. He was shell on wheels. <laughs> Maybe Jeff can do that next. Th that might be my favorite buzz story ever. <laughs> I'm obsessed. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about a really good 
feel-good story. 75-year-old Donna Osborne in Pennsylvania just wrapped up breast cancer treatment and decided to go visit her daughter in Florida. Her flight was delayed, so she had to postpone the trip. And on her way back home from the airport, she stopped for gas and got a lottery ticket. Lo and behold, she won $5 million off the scratch-off. More great news came in just in time for Donna's birthday. She said she called her daughter as soon as she won and now has her sights set on checking things off her bucket list like a trip to Alaska. She deserves it. Congratulations Absolutely she does. Her. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for watching the News at 6. It's great being with you. I know. It was so fun. I, I always love being here. Yeah. See you on the night beat. <laughs>